The Orbis Etherum is the metaphysical dimension housing all creation. Within are portals to worlds, pocket realms where life thrives, and where human beings live. The energy called Ether is omnipresent in the Orbis, so woven into life, so fundamentally necessary to this dimension's continued existence, that all living things are sustained by it, including humans who breathe ether, not air. Among these people are the Ethermancers, gifted with amazing abilities. An Ethermancer may possess enhanced strength and speed, amazing cognition, mental powers, even the ability to shapeshift. Ethermancy manifests in varied, awesome, and sometimes awful ways. But even those untouched by the gift of Ethermancy can affect the Orbis. And their influence, their impact, it can be profound. I'm Carlos, your storyteller. I will take you across the Orbis's history, delving into multiple tales, following multiple protagonists. We'll jump around at times as a result, but always with purpose, I promise. This is a serial told in many interconnecting parts. I suggest starting here, but if you're the sort who needs to start at the beginning, please feel free. Tales from the Orbis Etherum, Episode 20 Interlude Coping Methods Year 721 OAY The Kingdom of Kotan Major on Valterra On the wasteland world of Valterra, a harsh realm with little in the way of habitable terrain and even less societal progressiveness, lies the troubled kingdom of Kotan Major. A peaceful protest is disrupted by the kingdom's military, also a police force. Never a good proposition, but one that's the norm here. Protesters carrying signs reading Valterra for Valterans and Down with the Fascist Shadow Banes are treated less than amicably as they're detained and taken away. Some will never be seen again. Amidst the turmoil, a lonely queen watches the rule wastes from her royal palace, ignoring her ministers, her governors, her whatever they want to call themselves. Queen Elaine Shadowbane, the 18-year-old ruler of Kotan Major, stares out at the inhospitable Valteran landscape. Highness? One day, she tells herself, She'll find the courage to run away, out into the lethal world surrounding her insufferable little oasis. My queen, she knows she'll die, but she's long, long past caring. It's what she deserves, she often tells herself. Too much blood on her hands. Your highness! Elaine's brought back to reality by her court. What were they talking about again? Oh, right. The trade agreement with Land's End. Chalventi's denouncement of Kotan Major's regime. The mysterious behavior of the long-thought dormant Ferrostrilla station. Negotiations with the infernal Valiant Raider's leader. The so-called Chevalier the Worldwalker and the growing civil unrest in her kingdom, from people who just want to live free. What a joke. Freedom. On this wretched world. A floating orb, a device that turns thought into language, hovers near Elaine's head. She wills it to her hand, then through it speaks. We will trade processed Etheramite to Land's End in exchange for their continued intelligence on resistance activity within their borders. The sound of her artificial voice comforts her. She's thankful it's not her own. 
She's not sure she could stomach the sound of it. Chalventi's government shambles in obscurity. Their posturing denouncement means nothing and shall be treated as such. As for Ferrostrilla, Chevalier knows more than he lets on. Summon him and an entourage, wine and dine them, then throw them in the brig. Shon and I will convince the pirates to see reason. The queen stands. If there is nothing more, madams and sirs, you will excuse me. Elaine leaves, her agents quiet, not questioning her instructions. In some corner of the palace, down some arbitrary hall, Elaine ducks into a room, locking the door behind her. The no longer deposed young queen sits in a corner and buries her head in her knees. Elaine screams silently into her legs, quiet cries of anguish, of desperate pleas for escape, for rescue. It helps, just a little, but it doesn't change one important fact, that Elaine regrets her entire life, and most everything she's ever done. Year 722 OAY, the city of Aurora, on Delarctica. At a lonely pedestrian bridge, spanning a river at a park close to the city's edge, one gets a lovely view of Aurora's wondrous night sky, brightened by snowfall and city lights. Snow aside, it's a comfortable, mild winter evening, perfect for bundling up and taking a leisurely stroll. Jean Salrend, a teenage girl, is doing exactly that, letting the cool winter air wash away the day's stresses. She loves this park and this little bridge, her own semi-private outdoor sanctuary, for when nothing in the so-called real world makes any sense. Tonight, though, it seems she's not alone. Up ahead, leaning on the railing, Staring off at goddess knows what, is a boy in glasses and the definitely not for winter coat. Jean approaches, the boy's eyes acknowledging her, then returning back to whatever they were so dutifully focused on a moment ago. This spot taken? she asks, her hand on the railing about a meter or so away from him. He doesn't answer. I'll take that as a no. She makes herself comfortable, watching Aurora's distant skyscrapers. A lovely sight, but nothing she hasn't seen before. So she turns to the quiet young man, wanting to know his story. I'm Jean, she introduces herself. You? A few silent seconds pass, and Jean figures the boy either can't speak or won't. Strong silent type. That's cool. Me? I like to talk. You cool with me talking? Still nothing. Assuming yes. So, Mr. Silent Type, today was a mixed bag. A friend and I got into a huge fight the other day, and she still won't talk to me. Cold shoulder walked right past me. Kinda like what you're doing, but malicious. Not you. You're not malicious. My, my friend was. Still nothing. Jean isn't even sure he's listening, if he can even hear. She continues, regardless. I'm furious at my mom. My useless father wants to reconnect with her. And she's going along with it, even though she can do so much better. Says she still loves him, after everything he did to us. It's infuriating. Jean looks at the water below, and for a good long while, she says nothing. I can relate. The boy speaks up. Jean laughs. Ha! <laughs> so you can talk. He adjusts himself, looking for the right way to convey his tale. My, my last girlfriend, 
She tried to hurt people, he explains, and I still can't figure out how I feel about it, how I feel about her. She's sick, she's mentally ill and needs help, and I want to help her. She was there for me when my mother's died, gave me stability, love, confidence I sorely needed. Still, she went too far, way too far. Hell, I'm not even sure she's sick. I think, deep down, she knows exactly who she has become. The boy looks to the sky, letting the breeze play with his ruffled hair. So I can relate with what your mom is feeling. I don't condone it, but I understand. Yeah, well, you're as crazy as she is, then. Jean says. <laughs> Probably. A chill wind blows past, a slight bit of discomfort on an otherwise nice evening, and Jean shivers a bit. The boy, though, he doesn't seem affected. I'm sorry, he says, for not responding to you earlier. I was too wrapped up in myself. Yeah, you seem like the sort, Jean ribs. Orbis don't revolve around you, guy. Lionel. My name's Lionel Esno. It takes a moment for that to sink in. When it does, though, Jean realizes just who she's talking to. His appearance, his hair, his eyes, his face. It's him. Can I, uh, see your left hand? She asks. This time, Lionel laughs, despite himself. <laughs> sure. And yeah, I'm that Lionel Esno. He shows Jean his hand, a hand that's decidedly not human. Machinery, a robotic hand and wrist, extending up into his coat sleeve. Yet, Lionel moves it around with ease, stretching his fingers and rotating his wrist like any normal human. Rest assured, the reports of my criminal activities are grossly exaggerated, he assures. It's the truth, too. Jean, to Lionel's surprise, doesn't back away or run or scream. Instead, she takes his hand, lifting it to her face studying it, feeling it from every angle. So it's true, then, she asks. This is really an Arma? Yeah. Fused with me, cured my drain, made me an ethermancer. Physically, I've never felt better. But... But power comes with a price, Jean finishes. Right? Lionel just watches the girl for a while, letting her play with his fingers, test his reflexes. Hers is a refreshing friendliness. I is it just the hand, or... It's my whole body, Lionel explains. The arma fused with me wholly. That's just one of the few parts I can't make look... normal. Jean eyes the boy's face, then gently soothingly, touches Lionel's cheek. Normal's overrated, she tells him. Jean's not sure if she's dumb or crazy, but the young fugitive's presence is a welcome one. As for Lionel, the girl's touch both delights and worries him. Year 687-OAY Orbis Edge, the brink of known existence. The newly completed Orbis Edge Lighthouse, lit up and surrounded by several satellite structures, is admired by two women in a nearby craft. It's a masterpiece, Natalia Hennig exclaims. The vice president of Del Arctica, she's a commanding woman of considerable clout and indomitable presence. That it is, 
replies her world's head of science and discovery, Mara Shroud, a comparatively smaller woman concerned more about science than politics. Orbis Edge Lighthouse, built, tested, inspected, reinspected, and operational. A research station, a military installation, and a home for countless talented people. All in the name of discovering more about Orbis Edge and what lies beyond. So you do think there's something on the other side, Hennig says. Always figured, Mara. Me, I'm not so sure. But maybe, if there's nothing there yet, we can change that. Expansion, Madam Vice President? Shroud questions. Surely the lighthouse is meant for something greater than merely growing Del Arctican territory, especially since many worlds contributed to its construction. That they did, Mara. And they did under the agreement that, however the lighthouse is built and ultimately governed, it remains under Del Arctica's control. The lighthouse is our territory, and any interference we don't like, well, it's an affront to our sovereignty, isn't it? Hennig pats Mara's back, a tad too hard for the smaller woman's liking. Good work, Shroud. Make sure you thank everyone what needs thanking, too. Don't worry. I'll personally make sure the lighthouse is put to good use. The vice president takes her leave. Mara, the lighthouse still in full view, feels little comfort over what Natalia Hennig considers good use. Year 400 OAY The Bountiful World of Valterra Verdant, prosperous, lively Valterra The jewel of the Orbis Etherum a place of awe-inspiring beauty, arts and culture, exciting science, and so much more. So beautiful, so cultured, so exciting to live and work in, and so rotten to its very core. A dour, imposing man thinks aloud. He is Lord Pharos once a respected member of Alteran nobility, admired by all for his self-sacrifice and humility. Yet, these same qualities earned him many enemies among the world's oligarchs. Enemies that had Pharos's beloved husband and beautiful son murdered. Enemies that fed Pharos honeyed words of false condolence and insincere sympathy. Enemies that lacked even the basic decency to kill Pharos too, to reunite a grieving husband and father with his family in whatever lies beyond this life. In his deep depression, Pharos found an answer. A way to cope with the loss. A voice. The voice of a mother. A mother who whispered forbidden secrets of reality itself into Pharos's starving ears. Secrets Pharos would use in service to mother and to himself. He would build his iron star. He would unleash its wrath on Valterra. And, as a result, he would have his revenge. A pittance for his grief, but a pittance he will accept. That's it for this episode. If you like what you heard, and even if you didn't, drop me a line. My site is orbisetherum.com. 
That's O-R-B-I-S-A-E-T-H-E-R-U-M dot com. On social media, I'm at Orbis Ethereum on Twitter and Orbis Ethereum on Google+, Facebook, and Tumblr. Holler, and I'll respond. I'm also on iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, and Pocket Casts. Just download your preferred app and search for Tales from the Orbis Ethereum. If you enjoyed this podcast, consider leaving me a favorable review on iTunes. It helps me out. Thank you so much for listening. Until we meet again.